there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Today's guest is Wayne Leopold, an American organist, an extremely experienced organ music editor and founder, as well as owner of Wayne Leopold Editions from Greensboro, North Carolina, a publishing house dedicated to creating and publishing the highest quality organ music from all historical periods, organ teaching materials, books dealing with all things organ, and new hymn texts and tunes. In this conversation, Wayne shares his insights about organ pedagogy and publishing. Let's go to the show. So, uh, Wayne, welcome to the show. I'm so delighted that uh, you are part of this conversation. I was waiting for it for many, many months and was eager to talk to you about those things that you are the most expert uh, in uh, music publishing, organ publishing, these, these things. So thank you so much for doing this. You are very generous and welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to do it. Great. So, uh, uh, I usually start, uh, Wayne, these interviews uh, with the question uh, uh, going back to, to, to your uh, uh, early years. Maybe you remember the time how you first fell in love with the organ? Can you tell us the story? Yes. Wonderful. I, I remember the day. Um, it was at my grandmother's funeral. And it was at a Lutheran church. Um, and the church had a pipe organ, um, an old SD, two manual pipe organ, an American builder. And uh, I was fascinated by the sounds of the instrument. Um, it was a uh, probably early 20th century organ, and uh, it had wonderful celestes and a saxophone. Oh. A, a reed saxophone. And I was absolutely fascinated. And I decided after that experience that I wanted to learn to play the organ someday. Uh, I had studied piano for a couple years, but had not particularly cared for it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I dropped it in fifth grade. And uh, when I went into high school, I asked my parents if I could have organ lessons. And they said yes. Um, and they bought a little spinet electronic organ for the home that only has 13 little half pedals on the left hand end. You hardly see them anymore. And so I worked very hard and we got a teacher, a local teacher, and um, uh, she uh, taught me on a big Hammond organ in her home. Um, she was an organist in a local restaurant and nightclub. And uh, after about a year or two of that, I wanted to move on to a, a more uh, professional teacher uh, in classical organ. And so we went to the neighboring town, and uh, there was a man there who was primarily a theater organist, but a very famous one, Kay Maccabee. Mm -hmm. He's still alive. And um, I studied with him for about three years during my high school years, and, and we got a larger organ at home for me to practice on. Um, so my study was really on the organ from the beginning, not the piano. Mm -hmm. um, uh, after uh, high school, I decided, well, during the last year of high school, I decided I wanted to major in organ in college. And I went to Valparaiso University in Indiana, a Lutheran university, and studied with Phil Gehring there. And I st uh, spent five years at Valparaiso and three summers, got a BA and a BM degree in organ. And then um, during that time, uh, the study at the time at Valparaiso in the 1960s was very much oriented toward Baroque music at Valparaiso, German Lutheran. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I decided for graduate school, I wanted to study with someone who is specializing in romantic music. And I looked around and I found the name of the, t uh, the, the man who had been my teacher, Philip Gehring's teacher, Arthur Poister at Syracuse University, and I went and studied with him the last year he taught at Syracuse, 1966-67. Uh, um, it was a, it was a life-changing experience. Um, I told him at the first lesson I wanted to do study only romantic music with him because I had so much Baroque music already in my repertoire. And for the first time in any student, he agreed. 
And so for 12 months, uh, a year in a summer, um, I studied nothing but Franck and Vidor and Dupre, Rager, um, uh, a few other composers, uh, but particularly Franck. Uh, Poister was known for Franck. And as I said, I did 10 of the 12 works with him. Um, and it changed my life. Fantastic, Wayne. Well, that's a wonderful story. Uh, I think uh, in, uh, in every organist's life there is an, an experience early in childhood, right? Uh, like you say, in fifth grade maybe, uh, when somebody wise enough and generous enough introduced uh, him or her to the organ to the pipe organ or to any kind of organ and this this kind of uh, experience probably will will um, stay with that person right for a long long time and maybe inspire other people to to you know to pursue organ studies like it was uh, f with your case right so wonderful uh, Wayne. yes uh, and um, of course uh, today you are mostly famous for having the most the most um, quality organ publishing uh, house i know in america so uh, but but i think um, not every organist has uh, his own or her own publishing house so uh, can you tell us a story how it started what inspired you to start wayne leopold editions well, it started by accident, not by intent. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, 1975 came around, uh, I had been doing a lot of research after finishing my master's degree. I settled in Syracuse, and I just did a lot of research digging up obscure organ music, particularly 19th century and early 20th century music. It was not well known most of it at that time. And... Um, uh, a friend of mine, um, Barbara Owen, who has published many books, um, came and gave a workshop for the AGO chapter in Syracuse, and she stayed with me. And she saw that what I had been collecting uh, for my own just personal intellectual curiosity and performance. And uh, she went back to a publisher she was working with at the time, McAfee Music in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very interested in publishing uh, American music, 19th century American music for the Bicentennial in 1976. And um, she said, you should, you should get in contact with Wayne. He's done a lot of research in this area and has found a lot of things in libraries. So uh, I got a phone call one night from Don McAfee saying, uh, I understand you have a lot of 19th century organ music. Would you be willing to put together a, a volume or two for the bicentennial, and I'll publish it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had collected all the published, previously published organ works of John Knowles Payne. And so I said, well, I could send you pain, a volume of Payne. And he said, fine. So I sent it, he published it, and it was a great success in 1976. And I suggested to him that we start a, a series of 19th century romantic organ music publications. Mm -hmm. He agreed. And we started to do that, and I did an edition of the organ works of Arthur Foote, uh, Schumann, um, a collection of pieces by uh, students and colleagues of Mendelssohn called the Mendelssohn School, um, and then some anthologies, romantic adagios, romantic flourishes. And then I started a major project of the organ works of Alexander Guillemot with him. And we did uh, six volumes, and then McAfee sold out to Bellman Mills, and um, I went along for the ride, so to speak. Um, also, uh, in 1978, he came to me and said, I'd like to start a magazine of music. And so we started the Organist Companion mm -hmm. in 1978. Um, the um, uh, first issue uh, was, I think, in uh, December of 78. Um, and I have edited that from the very first issue mm -hmm. through today, and I think we're now in our... 37th year or so, 38th year. 
Um, we now own the magazine. My company does. But at first, McAfee Music owned it, and then Bellman Mills owned it, and then that uh, uh, it went through a number of conglomerate uh, takeovers. Um, uh, Warner Brothers, Columbia Pictures Publications, right. and finally now Alfred Music owns all of that, uh, except the Organist Companion. At one point, they gave that to my company. They did not want to do it anymore, and so we still publish the Organist Companion with me editing it. So, um, at first, therefore, I was a freelance editor. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I had wanted to do as soon as I got into being a freelance editor of organ music was I felt that we needed a better and new edition of the organ works of Franck. Right. And um, I um, uh, had done a lot of research. had gone over to Paris many times and worked in the Bibliothèque Nationale and um, uh, had the good fortune to meet the great-great-great-grandchildren mm -hmm. of Franck. And they still own a lot of the manuscripts. Fantastic. Personal possession and have never, had never showed them to anybody, musicologist. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I toyed around with um, approaching various publishers to publish the Franck edition, but... Um, I was uncomfortable because I knew from the publishing I had already done that once you edit something and you sign the contract, in a sense, you lose control. And so I didn't want to do that with the Franck works. I would not, not them. I would not want them to go out of print or anything. Once they were taken over by a company, and that company was sold out to another company, and so on. So I held back. And um, I had a good friend, Robert Schuneman, who owned at that point E.C. Shermer in Boston, called ECS Publishing at that point. And I was talking to him one day on the phone about this and my frustration about having talked to a number of publishers, but I just didn't feel comfortable doing this. And um, he said, well, why don't you start your own company? And I said, I don't know how to run a publishing company. Mm -hmm. I know how to edit by that time. I knew how to edit, but not to publish. And he says, well, why don't you come to Boston and we'll teach you how to run a company. So um, I drove to Boston from Syracuse, about a six-hour drive, and stayed with friends in Boston for three days. And every morning I walked into ECS Publishing, and they took me day by day, uh, one day at a time, they took me through various aspects of running a publishing company. And so uh, by the time the three days was over, they said to me, now go home, put together some volumes of organ music and bring them back and we'll see if they're ready to go to, to a printer. And they were going to use their printer. They said they would distribute for me, which was a big help. And so I went home and I put together 10 volumes of organ music, uh, five, five volumes of organ music of Alexander Gilmore and uh, five volumes of organ music of uh, uh, Edwin H. Lemaire. Mm -hmm. uh, one volume of original works and some transcriptions. Um, so um, uh, I took the volumes back in my car to Boston for them to look over the masters. This was before the days of uh, electronic uh, database uh, files. And um, they looked the, every page over and they said, there's nothing wrong with this. It's ready to go to the printer. And they said, by the way, we'll use our credit line with the printer. You don't have to worry about credit. Which was an enormous help. Right. And so in 1990, um, in 99 I started the company, and in 1990 we had our first publications in June, which were premiered at an AGO National Convention in Boston. Uh, I was part of the ECS booth, and they were my distributor until about 2006. Um, they were wonderful to me. It just uh, couldn't have been nicer, supportive. And whenever I had a question, all I had to do was call the 800 number and talk to Bob. And he would give me advice. It was a wonderful tutorage uh, to learn how to uh, uh, go through this, uh, the trials of this business. Um, so that's how I got into it, how I started the company. Uh, it ended up I didn't publish the Franck works for 10 years mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I did other things like Le Maire and Gilmo 
and uh, originally the company was started to publish obscure 19th century organ music and well-known organ music that I thought needed better editions right. that were available. And I have a philosophy about our editions. Our editions are not just the music. We want to sell a package. We want to give the performer a package. Not only the music in an urtext form, unedited really by any editor subjectively, but more than that, we want to provide the, the uh, uh, organist with a package of information of how that music was played, why it was conceived, how it was conceived by the composer, what the organs were like that the composer utilized in his mind and heard in his mind when he wrote the music, and anything else that would give the performer additional insights into how to play the music in an informed manner. Right. Now, that doesn't mean they have to follow every bit of information that's in the preface, but, we th uh, but my philosophy is that it's much better for the performer to know as much information as possible and then make his or her artistic decisions as to what they want to do with the music from a point of view of knowledge. Fantastic, Wayne. I agree with you wholeheartedly because uh, if you just um, uh, print uh, and publish, you know, some original scores uh, from the manuscripts, facsimiles uh, or, or from modern editions, you know, um, and... Uh, an organist buys that music, right? Very few people know what to do with that, right? That's Unless you have a great teacher uh, next to you, right? Sitting on the organ bench and, and teaching. But but I found your your collections of, uh, you know, those historical organ techniques and repertoire tremendously informative, valuable, and I would say inspiring too, because uh, when you uh, uh, read uh, those uh, uh, texts, right, about performance practice, about organs of the day, y y one cannot help but but really marvel at at the time it was written in, right? So thank you so much for doing this work, and and it's it's amazing, right? So so Wayne, uh, another question I had. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, maybe you could remember those days about music publishing business uh, when you first started and compare how it was uh, how it is today and to those days I bet many many changes uh, also went uh, on the oh, way yes. right oh yes yeah. yes well the, the printing process was different back then um, you created a master paper master right and it was sent to the printer and the printer had a big camera and the printer created negatives of each page, and then that was fed into a machine in the printer, and that's how the publishing was done. Of course, now it's all done electronically. We use a, a music engraving program, and we create a digital copy, and even now the digital copy can be sent as an attachment to an email to the printer. We don't even use the, the mail anymore, usually, uh, except sometimes we do send a paper copy just so the printer knows what it should look like. Because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you, you, uh, electronics is wonderful, but sometimes it needs to be carefully examined because it can go astray occasionally. Right. And things can happen. The computer can uh, do things that aren't expected. Um, but it's it's very different process now than it was back then. Also, uh, in the 90s, um, uh, the, um, the Internet really was its only in its bare infancy. And so you didn't buy organ music on the Internet. You bought it through music dealers. And CS had a very strong network music dealers um, and they would take the, uh, one copy of each new publication and display it and promote it um, and all that has changed dramatically in that now uh, so much of uh, the dissemination of organ music is done through the internet sales mm -hmm. and even uh, just reproduction it's, it's a very very different world today exactly. right right uh, fantastic Wayne uh, I bet I bet uh, through those days of experience, right, many, many years, decades even in business, you learned so many things that uh, you can make uh, wise and informed decisions for the future, I hope, right, for, for, for your company. 
uh, when, when this music publishing business is uh, revolutionized by internet, by direct uh, relationship with the customers, right? And with other, other things, technology especially. So wonderful. Wayne, uh, can we go into your, uh, um, your, your organ world? Basically, what kind of need uh, uh, do your publications provide for the organist? What, how you, your publishing business is different from others that are in, 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 in business? Well, I think the first thing is the thing we've already discussed, that um, our prefaces, I think, are by and large much more comprehensive mm -hmm. than the prefaces of other publishers. And that's a very um, a strong intentional part, uh, on our part to have that. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, I'm interested in um, providing new editions of old music that I, but have more information. Mm -hmm. And also, we are very much interested in providing uh, editions of obscure organ music that has been forgotten. That was a intellectual curiosity of mine that started in graduate school. In addition to what I studied, I always wondered what more there was out there that the teacher, my poster, would not ever have brought to my attention as a student. So those are the, the things I think that's motivated our company and um, is the overall guiding force. Another thing uh, with the company is uh, we went into organ teaching materials very mm -hmm. early on. Um, uh, the company was started in 89, we did our first publications in 90, and then in 1991 I already was exploring very seriously um, providing teaching materials. Uh, I felt that um, uh, up to that point, there were no teaching materials for a, a person to come to the organ until they've had at least four or five years of piano. Mm -hmm. And that was not the world we were starting to live in in the United States. Um, the pool of piano students was shrinking in the 1980s and 90s. And um, I felt very strongly that if a young person has an interest in the organ, they should um, get on the organ right away. And there were no primer series uh, where you could begin your keyboard study on the organ. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that uh, there, I felt there was a gap, a need. And so uh, we didn't have any models, but we just started experimenting to develop a primer series for the organ called Discover the Basics. Right. And um, uh, it has done well. Um, and then there's a follow-up series. Uh, Discover the Basics goes through the first one and a half to two years, and then we go into Discover the Organ, which is three levels out now, 1A, 1, 2, 3A, and 3B, um, which takes the student to the second, third, and fourth year, at least, in, probably into the fifth year of keyboard study. Um, and all this is new repertoire that has been written for these series, basically, uh, for our publishing. Um, by the level three, we could start to... Um, uh, utilize some very easy historic music. But we were very concerned that the music in these volumes, these teaching volumes, be interesting mm -hmm. to people. And a lot of the very easiest organ music, uh, although good, is not interesting to young people. And that was a prime consideration on our part when we talked to composers. Um, when we started... Because me editing the organist companion, I knew a lot of composers, and with Discover the Basics and Discover the Organ um, repertoire books, we um, went to about 55 composers, mm -hmm. this country and abroad, uh, to ask if they would um, uh, write some pieces, and we created a syllabus with guidelines for each level, and we had over a thousand manuscripts submitted. And so we were able to develop a whole new series of books with original organ music, not transcribed, not simplified from other sources. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I think uh, this uh, Discover the Basics and Discover the Organ, right, series is, um, I think, let's say, remarkable in the organ world because nobody be, uh, before you had... Um, had had uh, had this idea of starting uh, organ study unless you you have some previous piano background right so you did very wonderful i i think uh, it relates to your how you first started right you first started you say on the organ 
I knew it right could away. be done. It could be done, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and in those days, remember, three years, three hundred years ago, four hundred years ago, there was no piano at all. That's right? right. So what they did, they 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 probably practiced on clavichords and things like that. But a clavichord has a very light touch. Right. Lighter than even an electronic keyboard today that you can buy at Walmart or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so it, it certainly can be done. Histo- history tells us it, it was done. Mm-hmm. Because the harpsichord was only in the homes of very wealthy people in, in the Baroque period. So the average pract- the common practice instrument for children and adults, beginning keyboard, was the clavichord. You're right. Uh, one uh, summer, I had the privilege of going on a tour uh, organized by Quentin Faulkner and George Ritchie in the footsteps of J.S. Bach. Right, this. And uh, we went to all the, the the churches in Germany where Bach had played and or had designed organs and everything, and we ended up at Leipzig. And it was fascinating to learn that in the uh, the uh, the dormitory of the boy choir mm-hmm. boys, um, at the end of each hallway at each level at each stair um, each floor there were practice rooms and in those practice rooms were clavichords fantastic so that's, that's what the students of Bach studied on from the beginning of their keyboard study and uh, that just again reinforced my the own thinking and my own results of my own development I agree with you completely <laughs> probably um, in today's world uh, Lots of people start uh, first on the piano. It's, it's kind of kind of uh, default, right? Uh, musical uh, background for that's, many people, that's fine. but that's not, fine. not everybody. Not everybody. But uh, but as you say, that's fine because you can transfer many uh, transfer many skills from one instrument to another. Not not all the skills, but 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 many, right? Can you talk a little bit? Uh, what can be applied uh, uh, pianistic uh, technique, what can be applied to the organ? Uh, what what uh, is applicable in this case? Well, basic coordination and, and, and reading, I think, are the two basic things that the piano will give you before you come to the organ if you do piano first. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the touch is different. Um, and so you have to learn the touch completely. Right. Right, touch, and of course uh, pedals, pedals coordination with the... I know. I think uh, you have developed some unique approaches how to teach very, very young children the pedal pedal um, skills, pedal technique, right? When their legs are very, very short. That's yeah. right. Can you, you tell you, us a little bit uh, what we use? You can use a ped extend. Ped extend, right. Uh-huh. I didn't bring one of those today to show you. I could get one if we take a break. Um, uh, but uh, the pedic stand is uh, five pieces of wood that are hooked together with t- tongue and groove, and they can be fit on either a black key or a white key, and uh, they go up a, up to eight and a half inches high, it does, and so a young student with short legs can still put down a pedal for a pedal point. Um, and uh, the teacher only needs two of them because the e- easier pieces only require uh, pedal notes of tonic and dominant. But it, it, it's, we're not teaching pedal technique at that point. What we are teaching, though, is organ, and they're having a pedal experience, and they're having a real experience of playing the organ because they're utilizing the pedals. And that's a huge, exciting thing for a young child. Right. And you also uh, teach Wayne... Um Music notes, right? Notation as, as well. Do you go into grand stave notation right away, or you have some div- different approaches? Do we go into what notation? Uh, in, into uh, grand sta- staff notation, staff. or or different? No. no, we don't. We teach an intervallic approach to reading, uh-huh. which is the way all musicians really read, uh, rather than naming the notes, lines, and spaces. Um, it's an intervallic approach, knowing how far away the next note is from the previous note, a second, third, fourth, or fifth, or whatever. And uh, we, uh, uh, if you teach that approach, you don't need to start with the grand staff. In fact, the grand staff is very intimidating to a young child with the fuzzy wiggle things of the treble clef and the bass clef and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, all you need is one line to teach a second. One note's on a line and the other note's on a space. And that's all you need. 
uh, to teach the interval of a second at first. So we start uh, out very simply so that the intimidation of the grand staff is not present in the student's initial uh, learning experience. Instead, we start with one line with seconds and then gradually we add a second line and a third line as we increase the size of the intervals that the student, student learns to recognize and read and coordinate with their fingers. Right. Do you, do you also teach music durations, uh, arithmetical ideas like uh, quarter notes, eight notes? In those uh, we do that in a, contempt, in a, a traditional way mm -hmm. of counting mm -hmm. the number of beats in the measure. We don't do like a half note one, two, and the next half note one, two. We don't do that approach. We, we teach the number of beats in the measure. I remember, Wayne, when I first met you face to face in a uh, in workshop uh, uh, back maybe some 10 years ago um, in, uh, I think in Omaha, it was uh, during AGO organized event, you, you came there and uh, g gave a, a, a demonstration of your uh, uh, teaching materials. And I was fascinated by the name you gave to the quarter note. Can you tell it? <laughs> quarter note. We have we have four characters right. uh, that we utilize in the first book, book A, which is for younger children, uh, second through sixth graders. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And and that first book is uh, a little more focused the the uh, drawings and everything for a young child. An adult beginner would begin in the second book, the B book. But for the young children, we we did a number of things to sort of uh, try to relate to them a little bit. And uh, we have four characters. Uh, the quarter note is called Quentin the quarter note. And he's African American. Right. And Hannah, the half note, is Asian American. Um, and Reginald the Reed is um, uh, he's um, he does not have to do with the size of the notes though he's just relative to a stop in the organ uh, he's uh, Anglo-Saxon fantastic idea to relate to those very young children right and and you also have organ demonstrators right uh, w uh, can you tell us a little bit about Melodia and Major Octave yes um, Melodia and Major Octave were two characters uh, that we uh, originally started in um, the Discover the Basic series, mm -hmm. uh, book A. And they were helpful to the children, uh, to, they are helpful to the student and pointing out things and everything. They're not just entertaining, it all has a pedagogical focus, every page. Um, but after we were done uh, with uh, the, the primary series, we, uh, we enjoyed the experience of these uh, two characters so much. And uh, the graphic artist, who is an organ maintenance person, mm. not a musician, she said, I've always wanted to do a coloring book. Um, and so we decided to have Melody and Major Octave uh, appear in four different coloring books, as it turned out, right. teaching the student about how a tracker organ is built, how it is installed in a church, um, and um, also, they in one book, they visit a theater organ in a theater. Uh, so it was a way, uh, the, that series of the coloring books are a way to introduce the organ to very young children. Fantastic. And I think uh, since that time, you, pu you published, your, your publishing house published many more organ demonstration ser series, oh, yes. right? But right now, we're up to 47. Oh my, 47 organ demonstrators. So imagine, I imagine uh, organists who are listening or will be listening to us right now, uh, they will get an aha moment, right? Because what you are providing, uh, Wayne, I can testify myself because uh, I have, I own uh, Melo uh, the Mel Melodia series and a few others uh, from from Wonders of the World, right? Remember? And others. Um, right. It's it's amazing it's resource. It's amazing yes. resource because you can demonstrate. Literally, you can play for 30 minutes, for an hour, those fantastic, sometimes or, uh, mostly original pieces, very quality material to various levels of children and even teenagers up to the adults, right? Can you tell us a little bit uh, how you grade the material for organ demonstrators? Uh, the organ demonstrators are organized into four categories. Mm -hmm. um, uh, lower elementary upper elementary, um, middle school, and then high school and adults. 
uh, they are, some of them have a sacred, they all have a story. Uh, uh, some of them have sacred stories, like stories from the Bible, the Old Testament, uh, Joshua and the Battle of Jer Jericho, or um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, well, no, a number of uh, different biblical stories. Um, but some of them are secular also. And they, they deal with various other aspects uh, of the organ. Almost all of them focus on the four families of organ tone. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, uh, one has, uh, usually they're suites. And each movement of the suite focuses on a different color of the organ. Principles, flutes, strings, or reeds. And and they said there's always a story. Um, uh, like um, uh, the one uh, of the Exodus story of Moses, where, um, uh, and it, that, that's a theme in variations on this, the spiritual, go down Moses, mm -hmm. um, and uh, in that one, each movement is a variation on the hymn tune, on, on the African-American spiritual, and it utilizes a different color. Uh, for instance, there is a variation depicting the frogs, and that's done with the reeds. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so all of them are very, and some are easy to play. Some are quite easy. There's one with the story of Zacchaeus, uh, uh, based on a nursery rhyme. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, um, and uh, that one is quite easy. It's for manuals only. Uh, some of them are intermediate level, and some a few of them are recital level, so that you could literally program them, in, them to the recital. Uh, the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World is an example of, uh, of one that is more, more recital material mm -hmm. by Dave Marcus. And that one is in the style of Louis Vierne. Right. Uh, so uh, there is something for everyone, given every organist, given their technical limitations and their abilities, and there's something for any situation that in which the organist would want to demonstrate the organ to a group of people. Uh, in a church situation, in a secular situation. If you brought a group, a group of school children to the church, you would want a secular one. Mm -hmm. uh, if, and if, you, if you wanted to do something in a vacation Bible school or something, you would do a sacred one. They will also work, uh, the sacred ones will work for as children's sermons in a regular church service on a Sunday morning. Uh, it, the variety is incredible that we've been able to develop in this area. Uh, there, is, there is something for everyone. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Wayne. You just touched about upon one, um, I think, key point uh, that uh, I have to uh, also mention, storytelling, right? Because if you just demonstrate an organ and you say, oh, that's the principle, it's all very, very nice, you know, very metallic uh, uh, appearance. Uh, you can say, oh, the largest principle in the world maybe are uh, like a five-story building right uh, or the flutes uh, and the dim but you add another layer you add a story and the story connects to people's uh, experience right at a very uh, young age and so you are doing i think genius work uh, Wayne. i think so amazing amazing uh, uh, please go on the story holds their interest right but it's a kindergarten class or an adult group in a recital situation the story completely compels their interest. Amazing. Almost all of them have narrators, too. And there's a narration part to go along with each of the movements. It will tell the story, and also usually it will talk a little bit about the organ sound that's being demonstrated in that particular movement. Amazing. Uh, I remember how I first started to think about demonstrating uh, the organ to the children and to the adults also, uh, I didn't know what to play, and you provided this m kind of material. It was a wonderful resource. M Melodia, a major, major octave series, right, and others. Um, well, there are two with Melodian major octave, two organ demonstrators. Two. That's the one I use in my workshop, Melodian major octave, discover the organ. Um, and that's a very easy one uh, to uh, uh, technically to play. It's based on the American tune, Jesus Loves Me, right. and a set of variations. Uh, but some of them, uh, that, that's definitely focused toward very young children. But some are, are very sophisticated, 
and uh, deal with uh, various uh, events in history even. The Apollo mission that was uh, blew up, we have one on that uh, and with the astronauts. Um, we have one on uh, a poignant one composed by a doctor who's a very fine composer. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, he talks about different kinds of patients he has. It's fascinating. Um, uh, by, uh, it, it really is quite interesting. And he talks about patients that are hypochondriacs, patients that are real sick. And he, one of the movements even uh, is about a patient who dies. Wow. Uh, so, so there are happy ones, sad ones, whatever you want. And they're all explained in the catalog. Um, you look up, the, the organ demonstrators are listed as a group on two pages in the catalog on the website. And then you, go to, uh, you note down well, who the composer is. And then if you go to the first section of the catalog on composition, on the basic part of the catalog, the major section, look under that composer and the organ demonstrator will be listed and discussed. Mm-hmm. It will explain how many movements and what's a set of variations on whatever tune. And there will be pages of the music that you will be able to uh, peruse on the website. Fantastic, uh, Wayne. Um, many people, I think, uh, will discover tremendous opportunities, right? Uh, because there are schools in every city, in uh, town or city, in every country in the world, and there are kids waiting to discover the organ, but uh, many organists don't even realize they have this power uh, in their fingers and feet to, to bring this wonderful beast, right, to, to, to very young children and maybe inspire to pursue organ studies afterwards. Well, my feeling is everybody learned from someone. Mm-hmm. Almost everybody had an organ teacher or teachers during their young years. So I feel we owe it to give back and to also help the next generation learn the beauty of the instrument. In other words, each one teach one. Right, right. Fantastic when it's so... It's so uh, profound, right, this insight. And, um, and uh, can we talk now uh, a little bit uh, about other categories that you're providing? Maybe historical organ techniques and repertoire? What oh, are sure. this thing? Okay, about? If, you, if, if you go to the website or, the ca- or, the, or a catalog, we have a published catalog that we send anyone who wants it. Right. Uh, and if you go through the catalog, the catalog is organized. organized. First page uh, is the uh, practical, the area we particularly focus with practical music through the Organist Companion. And that magazine is an issue every two months um, and six issues a year. Each issue is 32 pages. And it starts out with very easy music in the first 10 pages. By easy music, I mean manuals only. But then the second 10 pages is music for manuals and pedal and the, they, the pieces will get a little slightly more difficult in that category until the very last piece usually is a challenge piece for the organist so that there is something almost for an organist at any technical level mm-hmm. uh, in every issue the six issues are organized according to the church year um, they are in the months of November for Advent, Christmas, Epiphany Uh, January for Lent, March for Easter, Easter season, um, and um, then uh, uh, July, uh, we celebrate holidays, um, patriotic holidays in July, and also it's communion. We celebrate communion and weddings in the July issue. Um, The um, September issue is, uh, that deals with that end of the church year, Christ the King, Uh, St. Michael and All Angels, Thanksgiving, um, uh, things of that sort, All Saints, Sunday, uh, so that the issues are organized according to the church here with colors to match. I brought a set of them here just to show you the colors so that you can organize them by color. For instance, the um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, November, December issue is red for Christmas. Right. Um, the January issue for Lent is um, purple. Fantastic. 
the um, this issue for Easter season and festivals is uh, re green. Uh, blue is uh, for the May issue, which is Ascension, um, uh, Pentecost, that time of the year. And then uh, July, as I said, is Communion and Patriotic and uh, Weddings. And then uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Reformation, All Saints in general is September. Fantastic. So that's, that, that's our gesture for people to be able to have music that's a very practical nature for church work. Uh, the next section of the catalog has to do with the general historic editions, the Urtex editions. Um, and, of course, I'm very proud right now. Of course, we have started a, a new edition of the Bach organ works. Mm -hmm. And um, here's a copy of Volume 1B. Uh, this uh, has um, in it um, the, um, uh, all the pedagogical works for the organ. Uh, the uh, Eight Short Preludes and Fugues the um, uh, pedal exertium and the orgo book line. And um, we have a large preface in here about the derivation of these works. And um, we also, in the Bach edition, are very uh, much interested um, in not only doing works that we know were written by Bach, but also we wanted to expand the box a little bit, mm -hmm. expand the parameters and include works that could have been by Bach, but we don't know for sure. Uh, we call it the box circle. And so each piece will be designated in the edition, whether it's um, by Bach for sure or if it's the box circle. Um, and a good example of that is the latest volume we have done, which is the trio volume. Uh, all the trios uh, contains the six trio sonatas, but it contains many other trios uh, and variants of trios that have never been published before and would be a very insightful for a person to utilize, a, particularly a student, because some of the uh, trios that are here in this volume for the first time or haven't been in print for a hundred years are much easier trios. Uh, uh, the editor, Jared Stauffer, felt that they were being, uh, Bach wrote those as a preparatory for the trio sonatas, which of course is not the place to begin playing trios, and that's more challenging work. Um, some of the variants are on our website. In addition, there were too many to put in the volume. Some are on the website and are free. You can download them. Uh, just go to the Bach page mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. website. Um, uh, we're very proud of this volume, It's uh, this series. Um, it's received very fine reviews consistently, both in this country and abroad. And uh, we're moving very slowly with the series. Uh, because George Stauffer, the general editor, keeps finding manuscripts and versions that have never been used before or consulted before. So we feel this is cutting-edge research in Bach organ music. We encourage you to take a look at them. Great. I, I'll make sure I add the, the links uh, to all the publications you just mentioned uh, in the description of our podcast. Wonderful, Wayne. Uh, uh, you obviously also think about the future, right? Can you tell us a little bit what's, uh, what is uh, Leopold Foundation uh, about? Okay. The Leopold Foundation. Um, uh, I, from the beginning of my study of organ as an undergraduate, I was always interested in collecting a lot of music, uh, organ music, um, uh, in addition to the standard works. I was, cur was curious to know what else is there. And so over the years, one opportunity happened after another for me to uh, get a collection of music for, from an organist who had died or a school that went out of business or whatever. And I developed a very large collection of organ music. Um, it got to the point of 40 four drawer legal filing cabinets oh. full of organ music and uh, then the question arose as I'm getting older what to do with this um, I certainly didn't want it ever to go to a dumpster and many libraries will sometimes accept things but then shortly thereafter decide to deaccess them mm -hmm. and discard them mm -hmm. uh, particularly if there's not a strong organ department in a college uh, where, um, or a university uh, and so um, I thought about what to do and finally I decided that the best thing to do was to start my own foundation and the uh, it took me five years to develop the concept until I was satisfied with it 
um, between 2003 and 2007. Um, uh, the mission of the Leopold Foundation is the preservation, reproduction, and dissemination of the culture of the pipe organ um, from all centuries and all national schools. Uh, the area of the foundation that we focus on some more right now is the archives. I gave my library to the archives and a number of people have also been doing so uh, either um, as they pass on or even during their lifetimes. Uh, so the library is really growing. Um, today we have about 25,000 pieces of organ music. Uh, many first editions of lesser known composers of the 19th century. Uh, we have about 4,000 books, uh, about 400 hymnals, um, 250 autographs, uh, the largest collection of organ methods and improvisation methods in the United States, over 350. Um, and we also have microfilms of various materials, um, periodicals, and recordings we will take, uh, both 78, 45, LP, mm -hmm. CDs, mm -hmm. and videos. Uh, uh, we want this to be a repository of all things organ and something that will last way beyond our particular lifetimes. Um, the collection is housed in a building that I own that also houses the, the publishing company. We own the we use the whole building. Uh, it's about 5,500 square feet, and the, um, uh, the archives takes up about 1,500 square feet of that. Um, the, uh, the organ music is all contained horizontal in acid-free boxes on library metal shelving, mm -hmm. seven shelves high, about 300 linear feet of library shelving uh, holds the uh, 1,500 acid-free boxes. We are constantly getting collections given to us, and we encourage donations of uh, muse organ music, books on the organ, composer books on composers, organ builders, organ literature, performance practices, recordings, as I said, and memorabilia, correspondence, photographs, prints, statues, postcards, anything that is organ, we will accept for the collection within the broad context of the culture of the pipe organ. Um, since you were so kind to interview me today, I wanted to particularly mention that um, we are interested in, in expanding our foreign aspects of the collection. Right. Uh, a lot of uh, the, many things get over to this country from abroad, there's no question about it, but um, uh, sometimes more obscure publications of compositions for the instrument do not particularly from Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And so we are very uh, uh, interested in um, having receiving donations of anything of this nature. Uh, and um, U.S. tax law, uh, all such contributions are tax deductible. All right. Fantastic, Wayne. Uh, generous work uh, you're doing. And uh, I wish you amazing... Uh, amazing future of for your f company because uh, your experience tell, uh, tells me and my experience with your company tells me that uh, many many years uh, lie ahead of you of of, of successful business right and uh, you're doing uh, very valuable work for the entire organ world not only for the united states but i i think uh, for everybody because we're living now in in global world uh, where everybody from from europe from australia from england from any other countries can really uh, find your work online right by the way yes. how can people find you and your work online can you give us a okay. link the website is www.wayneleopold.com and you spell my last name l e u p o l d and if you want to email us, you can just do contact, C-O-N-T-A-C-T, -T, at wayneleopold.com. Fantastic. I will include, of, of course, everything, uh, those links uh, uh, next to the description of this podcast. So um, I wish you tremendous health uh, for this year and many other years ahead of you. And uh, keep 
keep doing this valuable work you're doing it's so much appreciated i am I'm very very sure and of course you know that people perhaps uh, write you messages letters of uh, of thank you notes right uh, so it it really shows you you that uh, your work is so tremendously powerful and valuable uh, any closing thoughts uh, Wayne that uh, that you want to maybe inspire our organists today for the future well um, I have been a student of history and um, two things that I have felt are very important um, is that um, uh, it's written on our catalog um, it says at the beginning er text editions and insightful prefaces and keep learning for a lifetime fantastic let's learn for a lifetime everybody who will be listening to us also uh, thank you so much one more time for doing this fantastic interview it's so inspiring and uh, we'll keep in touch okay thank you if you liked this conversation I encourage you to visit my blog Secrets of Organ Playing at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you online really soon.